Rated will pierce the price on videotape. Watch this. <laughs> TDK T120 videotape at $5.99. Fuji T120 videotape, $5.99, less $1 manufacturer rebate. <laughs> and Sony L500 videotape at $4.99. <laughs> The Mark Thompson Show. I couldn't be more excited. The new year begins with, uh, would you, Kim, this is something of a major announcement, I think, wouldn't you say? Uh, Agree. I, I, I Absolutely. A major announcement I, yes. from the Mark Thompson Show. I think it is a major, a major announcement. announcement. Uh, he is the voice of our show. He is a brilliant a treasure of Hollywood and of the great void. That is everything. He's Shadow Stevens, everybody. Come on. Oh, God. Too much. Oh, Shadow, if you only knew, you are such a part of our DNA on this show. You've always been a sound guy and a radio dude. You reinvented essentially uh, the way radio was done in Southern California. I'm talking about with these super inventive ads. You ultimately ended up running an ad agency. You started your own ad agency and you were like, you were really crushing that for a long time. So your roots are in that world in, you know, uh, uh, audio creativity and that that game. Yeah, well, it's it just started when when you know when I was 10 years old and I started making things on my dad's tape recorder by cutting them together. And I thought, oh, I can tell stories. This is so great. And, oh, look, my watch is talking to me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey. That's on our end, I think some notification thing. Um, the uh uh that world though led you to radio you became you programmed radio stations in southern california and once you were in hollywood you just took full advantage it seemed i mean we you know we know you from your on camera career from your uh, your career as a voice guy right you just got here and you know splashed around you know, I I um I came to to KHJ. It was the highlight of my life. I came from you know from North Dakota to Arizona to Boston. I did really well in Boston, so I came out here to work for KHJ, the greatest radio station in history. And I started doing television. I was on. I was Steve Allen's sidekick. Um, and so when it came time, they, I was supposed to get the next full time position at KHJ, and they. Uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't give it to me because they didn't know whether I wanted to be in radio or television. Excuse me. Excuse me. This is national television where we promote your station. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, we're, we can't be certain. Well, just don't, you don't have to give me a raise or anything. Just guarantee me in my next in the next opportunity that I will get the next full time. And they go, uh, no, we can't do that. So I quit and I go over to KRLA, their competition. And I was going to art center school at night and I was happy, but I was, you know, I thought they should do better music. And, and so I did the, all this research about the music that they should be playing. And, uh, I presented it to the general manager. I just wanted the station to be better. And he fired the program director and he made me program director. And I was 23 years old. I went, what? I, now I had to figure out what would make good radio. And it was like all on me. And so it, it was, I quit school and I threw myself into it. And it was truly amazing. We had these jingles that were like, it was the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, this gigantic anthem uh, jingle singing KRLA Pasadena, which would be followed by some loud, exciting music. And I did 50 jingles that I, that I wrote and produced. And we did these hilarious um, uh, contests that were just, we, uh, they did, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar came out. So we did the, the, um, what was it called? Um, Hosanna Superstar, Hosanna Superstar. It was the great KRLA soup or star contest. <laughs> <laughs> 10 celebrities are floating in the KRLA soup. You have to name the soup and the celebrity to win $10,000 in 
and 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 it was this Hosanna, and the and the contestant would go bean and bacon, uh, split pea, potato, uh, Tommy Smothers. <laughs> it was the funniest contest of all time. So we we beat KHJ, and you know, to make a long story short, um, I uh, I did that for a while, and then they started making me make changes that I knew wouldn't work, so I quit. And um, I did. I, I just quit being program director, and I wanted to just go back to school and go to art school. And so then the next program director fired me because I'm always smiling. This is a true story. He says, I got to let you go. Why? Because you're always smiling. Uh, excuse me? <laughs> I, know you're, I know you're cynical about what I'm doing, and uh, I can't have that. Right. Are you insane? I'm the only happy person around here. I'm going to art center school. I'm what? So they, they fire me. And then I go into the accountant who looks, who glares at me across his desk. And he goes, I hope you go out and spend all this money in the next two weeks. And then you don't know where the next penny, where your next penny is coming from. Maybe you'll come to the meaning of life. What's the meaning of life, Don? Management is God. Oh, <laughs> fruit. he put the food in your mouth and he thumped his finger on the desk. They put the food in your mouth, thump, and the roof over your head, thump, management, thump, is thump, God, thump. And so I left and I didn't know what I was going to do. And then they hired me back a couple of weeks later for more money. I, radio is such a weird business. Wow. <laughs> Did you go back into that guy's office? Was he uh, eating crow when he hired you back? Or uh... No, you know, I, I don't remember ever talking to him again. Um, <laughs> I, I actually like the station manager a lot. He was the guy who gave me the opportunity to be program director. and But then that's when K-Rock came along, and that's a whole other story. K-Rock, you created a legendary station. You've always liked the big stuff. I mean, we, this is in, I mean... <laughs> They had to close down an Here's entire an radio in station to silence him. And now, he's here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Thompson. All I, all I asked is, Shadow, can you do a little something for the show? And I sent him a little liner, and, and he created that. I mean, that sort of big imagery is what is what you're so good at. It's like you don't think in terms of just little stuff. You think in terms of expansive, uh, dynamic audio. Uh, it, it, you've always, I think, been that way. Even with the federated spots, those federated spots that you did, they, you know, they became a calling card, and people look forward to seeing the commercials. Yeah, bludgeon advertising, we called it, and and we did 1,100 of them over from 1981 to 1987, and it was me and and five guys. It was a Monty Python group, and we would we would meet in my office, uh, or we had a conference room by that time, and and we'd brainstorm on Monday morning, and it was like, who's got an idea? How about Rabbit Frog Bonanzas, uh, Bonanza Days? Rabbit Frog Bonanza, I love that. Rabbit Frogs ate our warehouse, and we're passing the savings along to you. <laughs> okay, Chuck, you get the frogs, and uh, we'll shoot in a park. <laughs> <laughs> and and we would write we would have five six seven eight commercials written that more by midday and you were, you were quite the operation i mean really and then uh you know your world of acting that's a real thing too you were on dave's world you're series regular on dave's world i mean you were the you were in the in the core cast of dave's world yeah it was it was a great experience harry anderson and meshach taylor and the whole gang there and uh, jc wendell i loved and you know everybody it was a really good show, and I am shocked that nothing ever happened. We did 98 episodes over four years, and somebody screwed up the uh, syndication deal by demanding that it be tied with some other show, and people said, um, no, and then they just let it go, and it's never been seen again since. And it had great, I mean, um, Audrey Meadows played my mother. Yes, I remember that. How great is that? Right. <laughs> like a highlight of my life. Just rip it open, Mama. I'll buy you some more paper. I'm just not a ripper. <laughs> Do 
Here you go. A scarf. Oh, Kenny, it's gorgeous. But then, of course, it would be. What do you mean, of course, it would be? Kenny, I might as well tell you. I know. You know what? Oh, darling, I want us to be closer. And we cannot be until this is out in the open. Hi, I'm Steve, and I'll be your waiter. I know you're gay. <laughs> okay, I'll come back later. <laughs> Gay? What are you talking about? I'm not gay. Oh, honey, please. You're a 42-year-old bachelor, and I have never met any of your girlfriends. And look at this scarf. A straight man would never have picked out this scarf. I didn't. My secretary picked it out. And those birthday cards? She picked those out, too. I never lift a finger for you. That's right. And then Hollywood Squares happened for you. I'm just thinking of some of the high-profile stuff you've been. You, but you, you really. Well, you, you were in Miami Vice. You were an episode of Miami. And but the Hollywood Squares thing became this persona where you were kind of the it guy. You know, you started as the announcer, it seemed. Then you ended up, you know, kind of being the center of the show. Take take me to that. What? How, how did that happen? It's really weird, it, and it's like it's like a Marvel comic story. I mean, my whole life is a Marvel comic. Um, Way back in Boston, a guy discovered me and put me on television. And then when I came to Los Angeles, that same guy, Rick Rosner, the producer from Boston, put me on the Steve Allen show. This the the young against the grain, you know, uh, sidekick Ed McMahon. And years later, it's Rick Rosner who's producing Hollywood Squares. We're going to bring back Hollywood Squares. We'd like you to be a part of it. Will you? help us with the, um, the, uh, you know, doing the, uh, demo I went, sure. So I do the, the demo I had my own studio by then. And, and I, uh, you know, did the whole thing and little did we know that it became the biggest hit of the year. It was the number one, um, show, uh, of the year. And he said, no, we got to go. We're going, it's going to be all over the country and we want you to be a part of it. And I went, I, I don't want to be an announcer. And so I, I, I got a chance to do acting and i got to grab it and um so i turned him down and he came back and he asked me again and i turned him down again the third time he came back and he said how about this we'll put you in a square and you can do the announcing from the square you can be a personality on the show and you know when you you have to do a movie or something you can go and then come back and then tell us about what happened it'll be great it'll be great okay great so we do it, and it and from this little studio in in Hollywood, <clears throat> it became massive. It was like the number one show in the country. Who and, was the host of Hollywood Squares at that time? Um, it was John Davidson. Right, right. I remember that. I really, I love that iteration of it. Yeah, go ahead. It was, I think, is maybe the greatest version of Hollywood Squares ever, just because of the amount of invention and. They were the first to go to Radio City Music Hall. They were first to take the show to to uh, to Florida and the Bahamas. We did it from Hollywood, Florida. We did it from the Bahamas, and um, and Joan Rivers. I mean, come on, who's better than Joan Rivers? Nobody. Yeah, it was it was a great show with personality, and I just thought it was so funny that they made you. Uh, you were you you really the the wave of 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 Shadow Stevens was seemed like it was cresting then. It was really a great. Yeah, it was a great moment, and and then and then of course uh, along comes um, Casey Kasem leaving um, uh, American Top Forty. Oh yeah, he had to, and they were searching for his replacement, and eleven hundred people auditioned, and um, because of my, you know, from between Federated and Hollywood Squares, um, and the fact that I'd been in radio, they went, oh well, okay, it's probably good for him. But they were still paranoid that I would, you know, ruin their iconic series and and sent me to voice coaches and <laughs> what? Yeah. The first and the first show, the first show, um, the four hour show took 18 hours to record because I could not be the world's most earnest man. Everything I've ever done in my whole career has been um, amusing, you know, uh, satire. Um, tongue in cheek, uh, you know, making fun of things, just humor. And now I'm doing keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't you. It was, it was I Casey. It wasn't I you. I couldn't even make it. I sounded like a, an idiot saying those lines. 
And so we had to rewrite every every line um, for 18 hours. And then we figured it out, you know, and years later, it, it came really easily. We figured out. But I mean, they, they would, you know, say things like uh, I'd always said, and, and then <clears throat> at the end of the show, I'd say, until we meet again, it's your friend in the void, the shadow. Bye bye out there. Well, void. Vo what's void? Boy, it sounds dark. I went, it's not dark. It's the universe. It's the infinite everything. It's I'm your friend in the infinite everything. I mean, come on. What? No, no, no. You're gonna have. To. So I had to compromise and say, and it's your best friend, the shadow, which was. <laughs> That's not a compromise. That's a surrender. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, the thing that I like about your friend in the void or your, you know, from the void or whatever, I, I like that it's got mystery and the name shadow yeah. is a mystery name. It's, it was just so perfect. So, but it didn't hurt it. I mean, you, you continued on, you were super popular. It's around the world. It was an international show. You were, you know, let's yeah, no, it was terrific. It was, it was a great job. I mean, they flew me all over the world my, and my whole family um all over the world i mean from oslo norway to tokyo to uh, hong kong and bali and norway and uh and, and england and i mean everywhere yeah. american top 40. i think that's one of the earlier jingles <laughs> yeah yeah, we, we we um pumped it up a little yeah so that's what i like the, from the 60s or something um the uh Tell me about the the latest the internet product. We've got to wrap up. We'd love to have you back as a regular visitor. And as I say, your show, it just your uh, I should say your voice populates our show. But um tell everybody because you do these radio plays and they're great. And they're they're a series of them. And for those who would appreciate that ride, it's really a great adventure. Well, it's it's mental radio and it's and it's a series that is on podcasts everywhere. It's got a free app, mental radio is one word. And uh, when COVID started, I knew I'd be here in my studio and I, I thought everybody was freaking out. And I thought, I've got to create something that's funny and uplifting. So I wrote this whole mythology about the mental radio background that goes back to Nikola Tesla in 1893. And it's all based on truth, exaggerated and twisted. And we are broadcasting from a former Masonic temple somewhere in Hollywood. And in it are our labs and theaters and research centers and the outlook chamber. But really, it's an allegory. It's about the human mind. And, and all the stories are um, basically about themes. And the themes can be gloom and doubt and fear and change and time and space and joy and faith. And they have ongoing series of characters. There is. Um, there's one where there's like a story. A man falls into a manhole pouring rain and he grabs onto the wall and a tear falls from his eyes and it lands on a slug who flicks it off onto a leech who twitches and it lands in the mouth of a rat who bears a satisfied rat smile and a beam of light from the moon strikes the sparkle of the rat's pointed teeth, ricocheting back into the sky, burning a symbol on a cloud, a symbol that can only mean one thing. Dixon Ticonderoga, a square-jawed jackhammer of a man comes to the rescue. There's Guy Dixon and there's Guy Good as a West Guy Good as well, like, yeah. I love Guy Good. And Guy Good, you know, in one episode, he comes <clears throat> after saving the day, he's talking to the saloon owner, Lamone Souffle. And he says, uh, I got a feeling there's a flare up on a rampage over in decadence and we got to put the whammy on it before it takes down the whole poodle. <laughs> it's all that kind of dialogue. And before anybody says anything, Shadow is uh, drug free, everybody. So. What? what? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's incredible. But it's been called, uh, it's been called uh, audio acid. It's totally it's a sober guy. What? I know. It comes from a different place in his head. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, like uh, Salvador Dali said, I, I don't take acid. I am acid. <laughs> well, your art 
is way beyond this. We talk about the the oral art, the A-U-R-A-L, but you have, you know, you're really an artist and that really is what your your training is. And I, th- I know you're abiding interest in, so maybe that for next time. But um, look, you're a, I- I've always loved your work and it's so cool to call you a friend now and we love you on the show. And it's going to be a mystery though, Shadow, what this sound is, which we... <laughs> At the end of the major announcement. We, well, I've, uh, got, I've got terabytes of sound that I've been create that I've been collecting for decades, and big you know sound libraries. I have this German library that is unbelievable, gigantic you know like creature. Uh, there's one called Creature Foley, and it's like the sound of giant creatures thumping over gravel. <laughs> I mean, look out, hear it comes. Good God, save us. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Shadow, keep me in shadow. Uh, right, we'll uh, we'll post the website, too. And, um, this has been a major announcement. Yes, yes it has been. Uh, the great Shadow Stevens, everyone. Bravo, pal.